So the killing of Hardeep Nijjar, which has started this diplomatic firestorm between India and Canada, is getting curiouser and curiouser. Nijjar's son spoke to Canadian media where he said that his father used to have regular meetings with the Canadian intelligence officials, virtually one or two every week. And in those meetings, he was often warned about how there was a threat to his life. Why was he not given protection then? That's one large question that Canadian intelligence officials should be clarifying. And the other is that Hardeep Singh Nijjar was a man against whom there was an Interpol red corner notice. What were Intel folks doing hanging around a person who had a red corner notice, giving him advice, asking him to stay in, rather than doing what they're supposed to do, which is to arrest anyone by law who has a red corner notice against him? Should Justin Trudeau clarify on these questions before making such dramatic and public allegations against India? It's been 10 days since he did that, and yet there is not an iota of proof to those quote-unquote credible allegations which has been put out either in the public domain or been shared in private with India. But first, the story. We countenance that political convenience determines responses to terrorism, extremism, and violence. When reality departs from the rhetoric, we must have the courage to call it out. Without genuine solidarity, there can never be real trust. This is very much the sentiment of the global south. All right, so here are some of the revelations made by Hardeep Singh Nijjar's son. He spoke to the Vancouver Sun as well as other Canadian me uh, media. Uh, media. Uh, this is what he said, uh, that Nijjar met Canadian intelligence officials regularly. In fact, uh, he goes on to say uh, Nijjar, when he was alive, had at least one or two meetings every week with Canadian intelligence, CSIS officials. Now, these meetings started in February of this year and it increased over a period of time in the following weeks there were more meetings uh, than when they initially started he also said that they met uh, Nijjar last met Canadian intelligence officials six days before his death the next meeting was two days after his death now Nijjar was informed by these CSIS officials about the threats to his life now remember uh, here was a man who had threats to his life he had a Interpol red corner notice against him and Canadian officials were sort of hanging around with him. Meanwhile, another meet with intelligence officials was scheduled. Like I said, uh, this is what his son is claiming that it will be two days. It was supposed to happen two days after he died. Intelligence officials apparently advised Nijjar to stay at home. So why was he uh, driving alone in a car on the day that he got killed, on the night that he got killed? Why was he driving alone in a car? It does ask some very simple but very basic and pertinent questions, uh, bases this interview that Nijjar's son has given to the Vancouver Sun. Uh, number one, uh, the big question is, if indeed Canadian security officials, intel officials believe that Nijjar's life was under threat, why was he not provided security? The Washington Post story which came out yesterday said that Nijjar, when he died, he was alone in the car. Were these threats and the inputs of these threats, were they deliberately ignored by Nijjar and his family and his close aides? Because he had nobody else protecting him when he died, certainly. Was Nijjar drawn out? Did he get a call? Uh, or what, what is it that forced him to come out and, and take his car at that time? It was about 8, 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the night when he got killed on the 18th of June. Was he drawn out by someone he knew uh, or by some associate and then uh, murdered? Why was the police reaction, this is again something that the Washington Post story said, it took 20 minutes for the Surrey police to reach the scene of crime and once they reached there, there was this jurisdictional battle between them and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as to 
who is going to take the lead on this case. Also, before any of this was done, before any of this preliminary inquiry established anything in a prima facie fashion, why did Justin Trudeau go public uh, with the accusations that he made against uh, India so publicly in the Canadian Parliament about 10 days ago? Let me now go across to our guests and try and make sense of this story. Cash Heed is a former Canadian Minister for Public Safety. He's joining us from Vancouver. Uh, Vivek Kaju is former Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Gurmat Greval, who is a former Conservative Member of Parliament. Uh, and Michael Kugelman will be joining us. He's Director of the South Asia Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Centre. Uh, Cash Heed, if I, if I could ask you to weigh in on the questions that I laid out, basis what uh, uh, Mr. Nijjar's son told the Vancouver Sun. Why was he, if he was meeting Canadian intelligence officials virtually once or twice a week, A, why did he not have any kind of police protection? And B, what were these intel folks doing hanging around a guy against whom there was a, an Interpol red corner notice? Well, let me start out by saying there's a lot of misinformation that's out there right now. There's a lot of allegations, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are being played out at this particular time. We have several people under threat in Canada, whether it's related to criminal organization or criminal activity or some other type of activity. Police forces and police agencies, intel agencies, have an obligation to inform people when they receive information that there's a public safety risk to them. And they're obligated to share that information with them, but that's all they're obligated to do. They're not really necessarily obligated to offer them protection just to give them some advice and give them some uh, comfort that uh, they're aware of this to a certain extent. you got to remember, and I've done this before in notifying people that they're under threat, is people will continue with their daily patterns of life. They think they're invincible and nothing's going to happen to them. And we're, that's a common uh, practice with a lot of people you advise that are under threat. Mm -hmm. So again, we only have Nidra's son who's going through probably some post-traumatic uh, stress as a result of his father dying. But there's, you know, people are amplifying some of the things that are happening. We don't know that that's factual. We're, we're making some assumptions there and we're speculating on what may have occurred. But I can tell you right now, law enforcement has a duty as imposed in Canadian uh, law here and uh, with our court system, and they undertook that particular duty that they had. They no, don't so necessarily... What about the second part of my question, Mr. Heed? They can't necessarily stop, uh, what, stop the individual. Yeah, what, what about the second part of my question? What were these intel folks doing hanging around a person against whom there was an Interpol red corner notice virtually once or twice a week as per what his son uh, told Canadian media? It's re regardless of what your... Uh, uh, you know, propensity uh, for violence may be or whether you're under some type of other allegation here, they still have the obligation to notify that individual that they are part of uh, intelligence that's indicating there may be a threat to their life, regardless of what your background is. Even if you have an Interpol red corner notice against you? Even if you have an Interpol uh, notice against you, a red flag. Okay. Vivek Kaju, do, do, do those answers convince you on both these counts? Because, uh, you know, our viewers are watching this and I leave it to their be better judgment, but I find it rather bizarre on both of these counts. If, he, if indeed he had threats to his life, as is being claimed, why was he not given any, any security? Here in India, if someone, particularly a public figure, if he or she is, uh, there is credible intelligence to, to back that he or she has a threat to his or her life, then you give them security. That's what you do. Uh, so why was that not done in this case? Does the answer from Mr. Heed, uh, you know, add up? And two, the question about, you know, you have an Interpol red corner notice against you, and yet these guys are not uh, arresting him, which uh, my understanding is uh, anybody who's a signatory and who's part of the Interpol uh, group of countries, uh, you are mandated, the law enforcement in that country is mandated to arrest such and such a person if there is a red corner notice. Uh, as far as your first observation is concerned, uh, it concerns... Uh, really Canadian practice and uh, Mr. Heed is in a better position to answer that. Uh, maybe it is their practice not to give protection. Uh, in India certainly, if there are there is credible, uh, credible uh, indication or credible information that the life of a person is under threat, then there is an obligation on the part of the state agencies, security agencies, uh, to give some kind of protective cover. 
but what is the Canadian practice? Uh, it is for Mr. Heath to answer, and practices differ from country to country. Uh, and uh, now, the, now the one? second, yeah. now yeah. the second part of your question is the most is, as far as we are concerned, a serious question, and it goes to the very heart of uh, the issues between India and Canada, and that is that the Canadian system simply does not as yet, simply has not as yet taken Indian concerns regarding uh, Khalistani uh, supporters, people against whom there are terrorist charges seriously enough. And uh, the fact that there was a red corner notice against Niger in the normal case should have activated the uh, law enforcement system in Canada to take yep. action in accordance with that red corner notice. But this is not the first case in which the Canadians mm -hmm. have not taken our concerns seriously. It seems to me that the Canadians have serious, their justice system, the law enforcement system seems to have serious doubts about the validity of the cases that we make out and the court orders that are given out, that is why they don't seem to respond as they should respond. And hence, in a recent article that I wrote, which was carried in a national newspaper, I've uh, suggested that there is great need now for mature diplomacy, for a real conversation on all these aspects, Okay. Between India and Canada, because till now, it seems over the decades, starting right from the 1980s or even earlier, the Canadians and we have been talking sort of past each other. Yeah. We've not engaged. Uh, Mr. Heath would be in a better position to answer this. But the Niger, there was, all this was building up and the Niger case provided a trigger. All right. In fact, because that's what Omar that Aziz, uh, he was a former foreign policy advisor to Trudeau, he said exactly this, that uh, India and Canada and officials uh, in the meetings that he was part of were talking past each other on the Khalistan that's issue right. and not necessarily to yes. each other. But let me ask uh, Michael Kugelman, who's also joining us, uh, the response from the United States, it's been sort of middle of the road, whoever's spoken publicly, whether it's Jake Sullivan or Anthony Blinken, they've said, yes, we're concerned about it. We'd like India to cooperate with Canada, you know, uh, in these investigations and, and, and bring to justice uh, if at all such a thing has happened. N no one, no U.S. official has sort of taken a public stand or, or, or condemned India on this. And right now, in a couple of hours from now, I believe there's a meeting between uh, Mr. Blinken and uh, Foreign Minister Dr. Jay Shankar there in Washington, D.C. I think the moot point, everything is sort of the focus now seems to be Michael Kugelman on what's the evidence. Yes, Mr. Trudeau's made these, you know, very dramatic and very public allegations, but it's been 10 days now. What's, what's he got to back up those allegations with? Well, you know, once uh, Trudeau uh, made the decision to go public with the allegations, uh, he took a big risk because, uh, you know, he's, he's, he knew he had to know he was going to face pressure both domestically uh, and in India and elsewhere um, for, for him to put out uh, more evidence. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, here in Washington, you're right. The response has been very measured. Uh, you know, Washington has made clear that um, it takes these allegations seriously, and it's publicly said it wants India to uh, cooperate with Canada in the investigation. But this is just a very difficult spot that the U.S. government is in. It doesn't want this. It doesn't want to be in this spot. The crisis is very uh, problematic uh, for the U.S. because it's caught between a, a treaty ally and a strategic partner. And quite frankly, uh, you know, had had Canada made these allegations against pretty much any other country, you would see a very different uh, U.S. Uh, response, much less uh, much less uh, measured. But you know, the New York Times, among other outlets here in the U.S., reported that um, the United States, through the Five Eyes uh, Alliance, the Intelligence Alliance, uh, shared information um, with um, with Canada that um, contributed to uh, Canada's decision to. Uh, to uh, to accuse India of possible involvement, so you know, the U.S. has likely seen 
uh, some of the same type of intelligence that um, that that Canada has been able to uh, to gather as well, and yet it still remained quite quite measured and quite restrained in its um, in its public response. Bottom line, you know, I think that for all this talk of how we need to see the evidence, you know, I think that Canada and other countries would be very careful, uh, not wanting to compromise intelligence tactics and methods used. I think that you know the the Canadians would be very careful about putting evidence out there in the public uh, realm. If anything, we could see some selective leaks, perhaps, to the Canadian media. There's already been some of that, mm-hmm. but I just don't think you're going to see uh, Ottawa come out with uh, with the evidence that everyone is asking to see. Okay, uh, I'm, I mean. I, I'm not sure how uh, how much elbow room Mr. Trudeau has uh, now that he the decision to go public, of course, was Canada's and his. And once they've done that, to be not able to provide the proof either in private. I mean, Indian officials that we've spoken to, uh, including you know the foreign minister and other officials, uh, they are categorical that no specific evidence has been shared. Uh, as far as the Niger case is concerned, yes, there are generalities, but uh, you, can't, you can't take action basis generalities. But let me ask uh, uh, Gurman Greval, who's a former Conservative Member of Parliament in the Canadian Parliament. Uh, were you surprised, Mr. Greval, first of all, about the public nature of these accusations? Uh, Michael Kugelman saying that, you know, there's now some media reports suggesting that it was the U.S. that provided the initial intel. But... You don't see this often, where the Prime Minister of a country stands up in Parliament and accuses another country, another democracy, of being involved in the killing of one of its citizens. I mean, you've got to have some real smoking gun evidence to make such a public claim. You know that for quite some time, Canada has been grappling with the issue of foreign interference. There have been uh, an investigation going on. Hearings have been going on in House of Commons. Uh, Like everyone else, I'm also looking forward to transparency, accountability, justice, because sovereignty of Canada is important to all Canadians. No, but the the sovereignty question would apply equally to India as well. I mean, the guys who are asking for Khalistan, uh, that's that's a sovereignty question against India. They, They want to carve this out of an existing sovereign country, right? So... How, that, does, that, does that not matter? You know, every country has the right to defend and protect their sovereignty. Canada is protecting its sovereignty. And uh, it has the right that if there is a foreign interference, they need to, to, need to be fully investigated. And uh, justice, accountability and transparency must be restored into the process. So dialogue is the solution to move forward, I guess. But uh, for sovereignty, yes, every nation has the right to be respecting. Oh, yeah, this is and exactly what the foreign minister said and protecting its at, at the UNGA a couple of days ago that you can't cherry pick territorial integrity and sovereignty. I mean, when Russia attacks Ukraine, yes, the whole world, including India, was justifiably outraged because it was uh, the invasion and the breach of the territorial integrity of uh, one of the countries in the world. But when Khalistanis are asking for a state, state, a separate state out of the existing sovereign of India then how, how come this, the territorial integrity and sovereignty argument does not apply? You can't cherry pick that. But Kashid, there is this school of thought that Justin Trudeau has been doing this essentially for domestic political reasons. His uh, coalition depends on the NDP and on Jagmeet Singh. Uh, they have a huge uh, Sikh Canadian vote bank that they need to cater to. And this was his way of protecting that vote bank. And he's used this, this, this argument of foreign interference Earlier, it was against China. And now, perhaps to, to take away attention from China, because there's also been accusations of his government going soft after the Meng Wanzhou incident, the Huawei chief's daughter who was released in exchange for Canadian prisoners, uh, he has faced accusations of going soft on China. What better way to deflect attention than to train your guns on another country? This is highly political. Matter of fact, it's deflection on many fronts, and you've mentioned a few of them. The prime minister politically is in... Uh, chaos right now as far as uh, whether he will uh, retain government here in Canada going to the next election or we'll see some other type of government. He has a a somewhat weak coalition that's in place right now. Uh, I believe the way this was handled was uh, unfortunate. I believe that it's going to backfire 
on the uh, political side of, of things here. I believe that there was other ways to do this. You got to remember, there's still a murder investigation that is going on by the law enforcement agency in Surrey, British Columbia. And hopefully it will lead to some type of criminal charges and prosecution against individuals. If it has to go further to other conspiracies outside of Canada, let's deal with it then. But he was certainly premature. And I believe his grandstanding in our parliament here in Canada was was for political reasons, not necessarily what was the best thing to do to maintain, as we talk about, sovereignty or integrity of Canada. Okay. Uh, I also want to take this argument forward with Vivek Kaju. I mean, India, of course, and, and many say, you know, uh, it did respond in kind. It, it, it did re reciprocate uh, uh, measure for measure. Uh, and then, of course, there was the step of, you know, halting all visas for Canadians. Uh, there are concerns, of course, if Canada were to take that step, that would be uh, sort of detrimental to a lot of people who, uh, particularly from Punjab and other, other states who go to Canada, whether it's for an education, whether it's for employment opportunities. Uh, do you see, uh, Vivek Kaju, and especially after the MEA spokesperson last week said that we want parity uh, in diplomatic staff, the number of Canadian staff should be the same as the number of Indian staff who are in Canada, uh, would that be a backdoor way of uh, getting Canada to say, okay, if you, don't, if, we, if you don't allow us, the people, to process those visas, then the number of visas is going to come down? Uh, before that, permit me to make a couple of points, because I think they're relevant. First, I'm not concerned with Mr. Trudeau's political difficulty. He got up in his parliament for whatever reason, and he used very intemperate language and made charges uh, for which, as of now, as you have yourself said, Zaka, he has produced no evidence. And indeed, he can't produce evidence. I'll go so far as to say he can't produce evidence because there is a distinction, a basic distinction between in intelligence and evidence which will stand up in a court. Correct. If you have collected intel through, sig uh, through signals, uh, sort of intelligence, then that is per se ruled out in a court of law. So, uh, in that sense, I think, let's be clear, what Mr. Trudeau was, was acting as the Prime Minister of Canada. His political difficulties are not for India to decide. Second, I do believe that if Mr. Trudeau had not been so intemperate and had not taken the step of expelling an Indian uh, senior diplomat, yeah. India's response would have been more measured. But it was the sheer audacity and the sheer crassness of the allegations that Mr. Trudeau labeled that compelled India to act strongly. Now, there is a question of sovereignty being raised. And it seems to me that Mr. Trudeau has made the Nidger case a test case of Canada's sovereignty. But as you yourself have noted, it is our Khalistan and the advocacy of Khalistan also is a challenge to Indian uh, sovereignty. sovereignty. Now, uh, my last point. Uh, I don't... I think a parallel between the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the advocacy of Khalistan are not on all fours. For the simple reason that that has a military dimension, it has other dimensions, this doesn't. But it is nevertheless harmful for us because it revives very, very difficult and painful memory of all that transpired in the Punjab in Correct. the 1980s. And that is something that the Canadian system seems to be completely oblivious of. Besides, Canada's record, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, Canada's record of four decades and more of even paying heed to Indian concerns is abysmal. They seem to have an almost racist attitude towards the Indian justice system. Because... As you yourself said, there is a red corner notice, which is a standard procedure for cooperation yeah. in investigation. They don't seem to take it seriously. They seem to think that Indian pros judicial processes 
are simply not good enough for them they have grave doubts about these so on the one hand the canadians have this difficulty this lack of trust and on the other hand we are telling them that look what you are saying is completely wrong and this is also borne out by one other in one other case mm -hmm. which is which and permit me to say this because i would like our canadian friends here the canadian mp and the for, former minister to respond to it and mr mr michael kugelman also could respond to it when indian for service personnel apply for visas for canada they are asked intrusive questions which are not asked of any other by any other country they are asked indeed to break their own confidentiality agreements with their government does canada ask the same questions of american or british servicemen who have served in afghanistan or british servicemen who served in northern ireland does canada demand uh, deny them visas as it denies indian servicemen visas or former servicemen visas that is why i am saying that these are actually not this is actually a reason for deep indian grievances and this requires very mature diplomacy okay so let, let kashid uh, respond to that question of, yeah well, airing of Mi these Mr. Mr. Heed. Well, let me tell you, I'm not sure what questions they do ask, but uh, uh, I disagree with him that uh, we have a, a different attitude towards people. We uh, certainly are respecting our law of the land, which is our Canadian charter, and we'll continue to do that. So I, I actually uh, take a, a bit of a, a step back from what has been said with respect to Canadians, and your audience, sir, should realize that we're a welcoming society and will continue to be a welcoming society. Yes, there is a misstep that's going on now. It's caused a lot of conflict between Canada and India, but we need to work through that. We've got 800,000 Sikhs that reside here in Canada, and not all of them are in support of uh, separatist type movements and all of those Absolutely. various things. I'm, I'm from Sikh origin, and uh, I'm not a practicing Sikh, but again, uh, I'm proud to be Sikh, I'm proud to be a Canadian, I'm proud of the country we have in Canada. Okay, uh, Michael Kugelman, uh, uh, you said earlier... In, so please come in. Yeah, yeah please, once again, Mr. Kaju, once again. Uh, Michael Kugelman, you said earlier that there were multiple media reports, including the New York Times, reporting that the initial intel on this was given by the United States. Do you reckon, maybe because of that, uh, the decision that Justin Trudeau made to go public with these allegations, uh, do you think he... he would have, uh, if not formally, certainly informally, sort of sounded out the American side before he went public, especially more so because, like you said, the initial intel was given by, by America? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the Five Eyes Alliance uh, is meant to um, be uh, deployed uh, in these very contexts, right? I mean, that's what the Five Eyes members do. They, they share intelligence, uh, they work together and to, to discuss it, they consult each other. So, um, yeah, and, and I think that, quite frankly, this is why many people here in, in the U.S. think that um, these allegations have to be quite credible in the sense that Canada does have that advantage of having some very close uh, intelligence allies, including its southern neighbor, the United States, that can be in a very uh, uh, fortuitous position to help with intelligence gathering and intelligence um, uh, supplying. So, you know, I, one of the big questions in this whole crisis that, you know, none of us outside the Canadian government have an answer to is why, you know, why did he, why did Trudeau uh, go public with the allegations and why did he go public with the allegations when he did? But, um, you know, one argument that certainly gets a lot of traction here in Washington uh, is that uh, he probably was inclined to go public in part because he was so, he and his government were so confident that the information that they've been able to put together um, was, was, was sound and credible and that uh, it, he wouldn't have wanted to go out there and go public and make a fool of himself um, if there was good reason to think that these allegations were not true. So, you know, I, I definitely think that the Five Eyes Alliance is, is a very important uh, factor in this story just because, you know, it's something that Canada was able to look to. 
to help it as it was trying to make sense of this assassination and figure out um, who might have been behind it. This was clearly not Canada um, working by itself to try to put together uh, the information. It was able to depend on some very powerful allies, including including the United States. But all that said, certainly, I mean, there, there one could argue that there were domestic political factors in Canada that prompted mm -hmm. him to public with the allegations. I don't really know the answer. None of us really do at the end of the day, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there are there are likely a variety of factors um, at, at play in this story as well. Final point is that you know, I think, as we all know, the Canada-India relationship had been quite tense um, for in, for a number of months before the before the assassination of, of Niger and before uh, Trudeau's allegations. And one could argue that perhaps uh, Prime Minister Trudeau felt he had nothing to lose, given that the relationship with, so, with India was so bad. He had nothing to lose by going out and bringing out these allegations, perhaps in his view, to try to to shame uh, the, the Indian government. Because indeed, it's very unusual for a friend to come out with public allegations like this um, against another friend. Okay. Uh, let me ask Mr. Uh, Greval as well before I go back to Vivek Arju. You know, I had Peter McKay, who's a former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Defense, uh, for, in a conservative government under Stephen Harper, and he said that had the same happened under a conservative government, uh, they would have done it differently. A, they wouldn't have gone publicly. It would have been handled back channel. If you were in government, and since you're a conservative member, of, former conservative member of parliament, uh, Mr. Greval, uh, would a different government have handled this differently in Canada? It goes back uh, almost over a hundred years when the situation has been simmering, starting from Kamagata Maru in 1914. Uh, when the uh, Canadian government reacted differently to the British subjects at that time, the repercussions gave hand to or supported the uh, independence wave in India at that time. Since then, the relationship has been uh, rocky up and down, uh, but there are many similarities, may, many positive things as well. Okay. Canada is, uh, India is Canada's uh, uh, trade partner, but the uh, Canada's total trade India contributes only 1% of that. Canada is India's 17th largest investor. We have the huge diaspora, probably the largest diaspora in Canada is from India. Uh, we, have, we have good opportunities to share technology, to share information, uh, trade, as well as people-to-people uh, -people relationship. Okay. So government's approaches are different. Uh, Trudeau's approach may have been different. If I was the prime minister, my approach would have been different. Okay. Uh, Let me give uh, Vivek Arju the, is, uh, the final word. Uh, you, you wanted to respond, I think, to what uh, Kashid said. Uh, yes, uh, I have three points to make. The first is uh, a direct question to Mr. Heath. And if he doesn't know, perhaps he can make investigation. There have been numerous cases of American on faulty intelligence, bombing people, wedding parties in uh, Afghanistan, and uh, innocents, including children and women, have lost their lives. Does Canada deny visas to such American personnel, defense person? Does Canada think that these American service personnel are guilty of a violation of human rights? or those who supplied them with this information are guilty of violation of human rights and therefore intrusive questions should be asked of all American service personnel who are who want to come to Canada. It does that with India and other nationalities. So this is if it if it doesn't ask American or British personnel or other European service personnel, it is guilty of discriminatory practice. Perhaps if Mr. He doesn't know, he can care to find out. Second, is that this is a police investigation. It's a murder case. Normally, in India, the political leadership does not get involved in murder cases. It does not make statements in parliament or in the legislatures because police require evidence. 
All right. And intelligence is not evidence. And finally, of course, this is an important relationship. The diaspora is there. There are other mm -hmm. aspects of the relationship. And that is why I'm my suggestion and recommendation is that today the need of the hour is mature diplomacy. And for that, Canada being the party that made the first allegations has to take the first step. Okay, and we've got to leave it at that. I'm completely out of time. I'm really sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Kaju, but uh, I'm completely out of time because we have a special interview coming up on the other side uh, uh, in a special segment. But thank you very much to all our guests. Uh, as we close, uh, all I'm going to say is this. Like I said, it's not India that went public. It, it is Canada that went public. And when you go public, the onus is on you to cough up with the proof. Uh, so far, like I said, neither publicly nor privately has any evidence been shared, specific evidence about the Niger case, about possible Indian involvement in the Niger assassination. Let's see how the story plays out. I'm going to take a break.